One often overlooked but undeniable fact of Sega's meteoric rise in North America with the Genesis brand was the role that sports titles played. From the very beginning, Sega advertised sports brands heavily, tying them to big-name celebrities to try and appeal to as many fans as possible. These celebrities were often at the top of their game at the time, with players and coaches like Joe Montana, Pat Rowley, Tommy Lasorda, and Arnold Palmer leading the charge. Sega continued to evolve and improve their sports branding over the years into one of the main attractions to their 16-bit strategies. They bundled sports games with their systems, they developed new technologies like Sports Talk for their cartridges, and they moved away from the arcade-like sports titles of the early years and doubled down on simulation-like titles with far more depth as well as real licensed players and teams. Needless to say, the many sports titles that Sega advertised and released during the 16-bit era contributed heavily to its appeal in North America. And in this episode, we are going to take a look at a bunch of them. I hope you guys enjoy Genesis Does, Sega's 16-bit sports titles. Advertising for sports titles started as soon as the system hit the North American market. TV commercials and print ads featured these games heavily, focusing on the sports celebrities Sega had licensed for each of them. The prevailing thought at Sega of America was simple. These highly successful individuals would bring star power to the brand and were far more important than licensing real teams and players. Sega wanted the Genesis to be the cool brand that was only associated with winners, so champions adorned all of their software. These early titles were released in other territories as well, but often without the celebrity license. Pat Riley Basketball was known as Super Real Basketball in Japan and Europe, for instance. It was largely the same exact game in regards to visual, sound, and gameplay, just without the Pat Riley backing. It relies on interactive, large-scale cinemas to highlight impressive shots, giving it a feel similar to games that appeared on the NES from Konami. It's a very decent playing game for such an early title on the system, but it's terribly slow. Tommy Lasorda Baseball was known as Super League in Japan and Europe, and was an incredibly impressive baseball game. It has great detail in the field, including stuff like base coaches and umpires that were often missing in 8-bit titles. I also love the way the ball scaled towards the screen when you nailed a good hit, adding a touch of arcade authenticity to the experience. It has some great voice work as well. Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf was based on the Japanese game Naomichi Ozaki No Supermasters, but is very much the same game otherwise. This is actually a great game of golf, but it doesn't hold your hand and can be quite difficult to get good at. It does have large characters and great animation, which showed off the Genesis hardware at a time when golf games tended to be weak graphically. The European version retained the Arnold Palmer license. Sega made sure to have a soccer game ready for the Genesis as well. World Championship Soccer wasn't what I'd call a killer app in North America. The sport didn't have the popularity here like some of the other entries, and this game's simple presentation didn't help score it new fans. It didn't play bad, but was one of Sega's weaker efforts in those early years. It went by a few different names depending on the region, with the Japanese game being called World Cup Soccer, and the Brazilian release being called Super Football. There was a sequel called World Championship Soccer 2 released in 1994 that was radically different across the board. It didn't seem to play much better, however.
Fresh off of a Super Bowl win and being named most valuable player, Sega signed Joe Montana to an exclusive deal to help make and star as the cover athlete for their new Genesis football series. Problem was, Sega didn't actually have a football series yet, so they scrambled trying to get one made and released before the end of 1990. Since American football was mainly a U.S. sport, there wasn't the usual Japanese game to pull and reissue as they had done before. The closest thing Sega had access to at the time was Cyberball, but that involved a futuristic version of the sport with robots. Sega of America contracted a small company called Mediagenic to have a football game ready by the end of 1989, but that company failed to deliver. Desperate, Sega approached a few other companies like Activision and EA trying to license an engine they could work with. They finally settled on help from EA and Park Place Productions, the same company behind the early John Madden football games. Sega received their game, but it was a shadow of the quality of EA's property, with rumors suggesting that Joe Montana was purposely gimped to be a weaker game. Sega had spent so much money acquiring the Joe Montana branding, it was one of the earliest games to retain the same name in every region it was released in. Sega got its shit together the following year and got Blue Sky Software to develop a proper game of their own, Joe Montana Sports Talk Football 2. It was Sega's first entry in the Sports Talk line, a feature that allowed full spoken commentary in a cartridge game. While it was a little scratchy, it was unbelievable to hear that much voice in a home game. Arcade games didn't speak as much, so it felt like something deluxe and groundbreaking. The game itself was just okay, but Blue Sky Software quickly evolved, and the following year's game, NFL Sports Talk Football 93 starring Joe Montana, finally nailed what Sega had needed. Now a fully licensed, fully featured simulation of the sport, the inclusion of the Sports Talk technology, and the vast improvements to gameplay made it one of the best NFL games available on any platform. Lines up for the kickoff. Puts it up. Caught at the 7. Across the 25th and stopped at the 28 yard line. With Mike Tyson being so closely related to the Nintendo branding in 1989, Sega was quick to jump on his loss at the hands of James Buster Douglas in early 1990. Taito's arcade boxing game Final Blow had just been ported to the Japanese Mega Drive, so Sega of America licensed and repurposed the game for North America and Europe, adding Douglas's namesake and likeness to the lineup of fighters. It was released and heavily advertised as Sega's big boxing entry, capitalizing on both Tyson's stunning loss and Douglas's instant celebrity. <laughs> Sega needed a hockey game for its Genesis as well, so they went out and scored Mario Lemieux to be the face of their franchise. Ringler Studios would do the honors developing the software, and it was released in late 1992. Unlike other games from Ringler, like the awful Genesis version of Revenge of the Joker, they actually did an okay job here. The graphics are colorful, and it plays decent for the most part. Sega wouldn't publish many hockey games themselves for the Genesis, but this was a very decent and playable take on the sport. Sega, of course, wasn't above backing a different horse, and they quickly switched over to Evander Holyfield as their new face of boxing games. Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing was released in 1992 and was developed by Acme Interactive. Whereas Final Blow had been arcade simplicity, Real Deal Boxing here set out to be a serious simulation of the sport. 
No instant knockouts or gimmicks. You genuinely had to outbox your opponent with jabs, hooks, and uppercuts to get the win. You started from nothing, building your boxer's skills and power to finally meet Holyfield himself. It doesn't have licensed boxers, but it's a hell of a good game of boxing all the same. Box. Sega continued to evolve its sports brand in 1992 and released Sports Talk Baseball. This was based on the internationally developed Japanese game Super League 91, adding the Sports Talk tech into the American release. Better graphics, real players, and running commentary really upped this game's overall appeal past Tommy Lasorda Baseball. It also includes more modes of play like a full 162 game season, playoffs, and a championship mode. Ball one. Delivered. Fly ball deep to center. It drops in. The runner scores. He has it close to third. The runner scores. In there with a double. Sega continued the expansion of new sports games in 1992 with David Robinson's Supreme Court. Acme Interactive was at the helm of this one as well and this time we get an isometric engine loaded with great animations and some decent gameplay. Unfortunately there are no licensed teams or players here, though it does add a few more modes for you to mess around with. It was a step in the right direction but Sega needed more time and features to catch the competition. I didn't like the fade out transitions going from one court to the other, something Acme seemed fascinated with for years. Despite some highs and lows in quality, Sega sold a ton of games during its first two full years on the market. When 1993 began, they pushed their sports brands to new heights. Gone were the days of simple arcade games without proper league and player licenses, and every game in their stable would include a plethora of new modes and be fully licensed. Even better, Sega finally started putting battery backups in their sports games regularly letting you save seasons, stats, and created players and teams. Sega also started using the Sega Sports brand around this time, making sure the world knew that when it came to their favorite pastimes, Sega was the place to be. In 1993, Sega released a sequel to Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing called Greatest Heavyweights. This upgraded engine had better animation, even more strategic gameplay, and included some of boxing's most iconic fighters. Want to see Muhammad Ali battle Larry Holmes in his prime? Well here you go. You can also create a player and battle your way to the top. This and Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing are the best 16-bit boxing games by a mile thanks to its robust engine that tries and succeeds in making it feel like a real boxing match. This was also one of the very first games to use the Sega Sports branding a logo that would become synonymous with gaming excellence over the next decade. There would be four more Sega published NFL football games during the life of the Genesis. NFL Football 94 starring Joe Montana would expand on the formula set in the previous version. You got a battery backup to save your games, a bunch of camera options to change how the game played, and an all-around excellent game of football. Joe Montana would also grace the cover of NFL 95, which saw some pretty big changes to the engine. Now with much larger players, it does away with the zoom feature of the previous games. I didn't care for this one as much as others in the series. It felt slower and jerkier, and it had some nasty sprite flicker that really impacted the presentation. Montana had switched over to the Kansas City Chiefs for these two games, where he would play his final two seasons. With Joe Montana retired, Sega needed a new face for its NFL games, releasing primetime NFL football starring Deion Sanders in late 1995. 
It continues the engine of NFL 95 with upgraded rosters and minor changes to the menus and setup screen. This game was in development for the 32X and Sega Saturn at the same time, but never materialized as final products. Sega's final football game for the Genesis was released in mid-1997 as NFL 98. With the Saturn brand all but dead in North America, they cobbled together one last hurrah for the mighty engine that had done them so well in the previous years. It's a simple roster update to primetime NFL football and nothing more. Popular Raiders receiver Tim Brown was on the cover. After the success of Sports Talk Baseball, Sega knew that it needed something special the following year. They went out and got the full MLB license and with the help of Blue Sky Software, created the World Series Baseball franchise. Starting with 1994, you got all the modes of the previous game, but now with more realistic graphics, real teams and players, and even more simulation aspects to bring it closer to the actual sport. They improved the Sports Talk technology as well, adding even more play-by-play -play variety from broadcaster Jerry Coleman to keep things fresh. The series would run for three more games after 1994, with a 1995, 96, and 98 edition seeing Genesis releases. Each one would see little revisions to the presentation, but were largely the same games. It proved so popular a franchise, Sega also made a 32X version and continued the namesake on the Sega Saturn. Few 16-bit baseball games had the sheer level of accuracy and detail this series did. Sega needed a few games to get it right, but they finally nailed it here. The popularity of college football wasn't lost on Sega either, and in 1994 they had Blue Sky Software create a new series called College Football's National Championship. This new game was based on the Montana NFL 94 engine, but uses college teams from all over the U.S. Like NFL 94, it's an excellent game of simulation football with deep playbooks, excellent AI, sports talk technology, and tons of camera angles to make it feel a little different depending on your view. It proved a big hit and Sega would release a second part to the series the following year. Largely the same game, Sega would drop the sports talk feature in this one. While Sega's basketball games had been decent in the early years of the Genesis, they needed to step up their quality to compete with other companies and their products. Sega would get the full NBA license and create the first in the franchise, NBA Action 94. Malibu Interactive would develop it and it saw a ton of upgrades over the previous basketball games from Sega. The gameplay was lightning fast and you got a much broader view of the court. The engine also featured a really cool camera angle switch at half court when the ball changed hands. This perspective was admittedly jarring as hell the first time you saw it, but once you got used to it, it offered something that wouldn't become standard until 32-bit sports titles, a dynamic camera. Unfortunately, not everyone appreciated the game, and the series would see a vast reworking the following year. NBA Action 95 starring David Robinson would get a completely different engine played from an overhead angle. Despite the players being larger and more detailed, it somehow felt slower and less innovative than the previous incarnation. It still played fairly well, but I wish Sega had evolved the 94 engine a bit instead of scrapping it all together. Sega needed more representation in the sport of hockey, so they developed the fully licensed NHL All-Star Hockey 95. Sega faced fierce competition from EA and their complete dominance of NHL games for years by this point. The effort was quite solid, however. 
The players were well animated, the gameplay fast, and it has the features to keep you playing. EA's hockey game had been a juggernaut, and anything that played differently wasn't held in as high as regard. I thought it was an excellent hockey game with some of the better visuals for these types of games. It must have sold well because Sega would continue the franchise on the Sega Saturn soon after. Most people know about the Saturn version of Pebble Beach Golf Links, but there was also a version for the Sega Genesis under the Sega Sports banner. It comes loaded with practice, skins game, tournament, stroke play, and match play modes. It also has real golfers of the time, instant replays, and a battery backup to save all of your stats. T&E Soft would develop it, and overall it was as good as the Saturn version aside from a hit in the visuals. A four-player mode rounded out this very good attempt at Sega's very own golf game. Sega also had a go at making tennis games on the Genesis. The four-player Wimbledon Championship Tennis was released in late 1993 and features great animation, exhibition, and tournament modes, your choice of surface type, as well as 24 different players to choose from. While it was a very decent attempt at the sport, it was 1995's ATP Tour Championship Tennis that nailed it best. It's a complete package of visuals, options, gameplay, and retains all of the things from the previous release. You got real players past and present, a battery backup to save all of your tournament progress, and a fully featured create a player mode to start from nothing and work your way to the championship. If you want the best tennis game on the Genesis, this is the one to own. While this episode was all about the games Sega made and published for the Genesis and Mega Drive, the sports goodness didn't stop there. Companies like EA, Tecmo, Acclaim, Konami, and Accolade all loaded the platform down with copious amounts of sports goodness. The John Madden series was extremely popular, spawning nine entries itself, and that's not counting the other games based on its style of play from EA, like the Bill Walsh College Football series. EA also had the NHL hockey games, which set an excellence for the sport that took other systems years to catch up. The incredibly popular Tecmo Super Bowl showed up three times on the Genesis, taking the NES Classic and giving it a big boost in visual fidelity and features. Acclaim brought a pile of sports entries with it, but it was the WWF wrestling titles that I appreciated most. Royal Rumble and Raw were awesome with a few friends over. The truth was, if Sega's own sports games didn't satisfy your itch for whatever sport you wanted, there was absolutely no shortage of options to turn to. There was a game for you on the Genesis. All you had to do was find it. The big takeaway from this episode isn't just that the Sega Genesis was an incredible platform for sports games, but also just how incredible it was that Sega of America failed so heinously in continuing that dominance on the Sega Saturn. How could a company that owned over 50% of the gaming market in North America, and make no mistake, sports titles contributed heavily to that percentage, not have an absolutely rock-solid catalog of titles ready for the launch of their brand new platform. Sega didn't even have an American football game ready for the Saturn until the end of 1996, well over a year after the system launched. In fact, nearly all of the most popular sports in the US came to the Saturn well after they should have, 
allowing Sony and its PlayStation to easily strip away Sega's crown as the best place to be a sports fan. I mean, it came without a fight of any kind, almost as if Sega's management purposefully abdicated the responsibility to hurt the brand. And I don't want to hear that Sega didn't have the resources because of the damn 32X, because Sega had other projects come out at a time showing that they had the ability to commission such titles if they were so inclined. And I also don't want to hear about the early launch. The system was still supposed to come out in September of 1995, in which case most of these sports games still weren't ready. The fact that Sega didn't heavily pursue sports games to have ready at the launch of the Saturn is nothing short of a dereliction of duty. You cannot sell a $400 console that doesn't have a single game the company is known for. What an unbelievable mess that entire situation was. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.